Welcome back to the Neuroscience Meets Social and Emotional Learning Podcast for episode number 149. With Dave Farrow, a two-time Canadian Guinness World Record holder for most decks of playing cards memorized in a single sighting in 1996, and again in 2007, when he correctly memorized and recalled the exact order of 59 decks of shuffled playing cards, which is 3,068 cards in total, exceeding his previous record of 52 decks or 2,704 cards. Wow. I'm Andrea Samadhi, author and educator from Toronto, Canada, now in Arizona, and like many of our listeners have been fascinated with learning and understanding the science behind high performance strategies in our school sports and the workplace with ideas that we can all use, understand and implement immediately. I can't tell you how excited I am to speak with fellow Canadian Dave Farrow, who wasn't born with the gift of memory. He was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia as a child. To help him to do better in school, Dave created a memory system called the Farrow Method, which is now a certifiable, scientifically proven system for memory, backed by a double-blind neuroscience study at McGill University. In 2008, Dave was hired by Sony Corporation to live in a window on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan and speed read on a Sony e-reader for literacy in America. In 30 days, he read over 100 books, and through his efforts, Sony gave 4.4 million ebooks to schools in America. Over 100 million people watched him in the window read for charity. As a memory expert, David has trained over 10,000 business professionals, students, managers, and seminar attendees in memory programs offered in both Canada and the United States, with that number growing each day. Today, Dave uses his media savvy and keen understanding of the brain in the public relations sector. He's the founder and CEO of Faro PR, a full service public relations and marketing firm in Buffalo, New York. With his ability to speed read and memorize large amounts of information, Dave is an expert in nanotechnology and microfluidics and is currently developing a prototype for a robotic moving mannequin with Startup New York. Dave has been a featured guest speaker on over 2,000 interviews in the media, including The Today Show, Live with Regis and Kathy, Steve Harvey, Discovery Channel, and many more. I was introduced to Dave Farrow after episode 145 with Howard Berg, who holds the Guinness World Record for speed reading, and I immediately started to make connections with his work and past interviews and episodes. I'm always looking at ways to improve memory, especially after my brain scan at Amen Clinic showed that I was weak in the area of recall memory or recalling a list of random words. And Dr. Creedo, who did my brain scan evaluation, reminded me that we can change our brain and memory with practice, but we must first of all believe it's possible. After seeing how easy it was to remember a list of 10 items with my interview with Howard Berg, I'm dying to learn more from Dave Farrow and share these strategies with you. Welcome Dave Farrow. Thank you so much for meeting with me today. And I see Dave that you originally grew up in Kitchener, Ontario and growing up in Toronto, I spent a lot of time in Kitchener in high school when a friend of mine moved. And have I got this right off of the Homer Watson Boulevard exit? Is that an exit in Kitchener? Do I remember that right? Or do you? Uh, Yeah, yeah. That's usually the, the, that's the exit on the other side. I normally take the, uh, the other exit going towards Toronto. Uh, That's my, that was my big commute for a while. Um, but yeah, I love I love the K dot as we used to call it. It's uh, I don't know if it was just me that called it that, but uh, it's uh, it's a great place. It's like a little, little Toronto. It's got everything, but it's a little uh, more uh, you know compact, you know, intimate. Got it. Well, it was fun to see a fellow Canadian, and from reading your story, 
You know, it was it was interesting just to look back and make connections with other speakers. And I saw how you got behind with your academics when you were young with the health challenges that that you say that you had. And your story reminded me of someone I interviewed years ago. His name was Nick Halleck, and he's on my episode 31, so a couple of years ago now. But he overcame an illness by studying the Encyclopedia Britannica and went on to lead an amazing life. What do you remember about your early years that motivated you to learn, study, and begin developing the talents that would set you miles apart from others in the future? Yeah, I actually remember hearing about uh, Nick's story. It's very inspirational. Um, and uh, there's a lot of stories of uh, uh, like that, of people who have you know, maybe a stroke or something. There's a great one of a yo-yo expert that uh, battled, uh, basically rebuilt his brain by relearning all the yo-yo tricks. He was this world champion yo-yoist and had a had a stroke that sort of thing and uh you know things like that inspire me to this day um when i was uh, 14 years old it's kind of late by today's standards but i was diagnosed with adhd and dyslexia this was in the 90s so it was a relatively new term and there was a lot of uh problems with that they didn't know how to handle it they certainly didn't know how to medicate for it there was a lot of a lot of issues um and in my experience this is just my experience there's a lot of fantastic teachers that helped me get where i've got to be uh but uh, there were a few that were very difficult uh because this diagnosis along with the dyslexia diagnosis pretty much in their eyes meant that i was a write-off uh and i even had one teacher say uh not to expect much out of life that is word for word verbatim what he said um to a 14 year old like think about that you know just stop setting goals at 14 your life's over like just the the yep. it bottles the mind now mm -hmm. but um instead of taking it as an attack i like a lot of kids i thought i was right and they were wrong it turns out i was right uh it just took me uh something like six, seven years to prove it, I started to uh, look at my brain like an engineer would and say, okay, I've got these problems, but there has to be a solution. And I started looking into different ways to train my brain. Brain training was actually even controversial in those days because brain plasticity was not the accepted science. I actually had a number of neuroscientists that really uh, fought me uh, in my early days when I, I have a best-selling memory course, by the way, it sold over 100,000 copies worldwide. And I had uh, neuroscientists saying it was, it was snake oil because I was talking about training your plastic brain before that was accepted science. It was at that time, it was the belief that your brain was hardwired. And I find that these two philosophies, um, society kind of goes back and forth between the idea that people are the way they are and they can never change. And no, change is possible, but it's a question of how. And I'm definitely on the, se the side of the second. Um, I know it's difficult. And the fact that it's difficult shouldn't make people think it's impossible. So I basically, one at a time, I, I took traits that I didn't like, things like I used to panic on tests and blank out and do very badly on memory tests. So I looked to improve my memory. I used to have focus issues. So I came up with techniques for focus. And I learned everything that I could learn about, about uh, the, the art of memory. And I started practicing it. Then I started coming up with my own techniques. And I've invented about five five different techniques that I'm accredited with uh, today. And uh, they've gone on to uh, bigger and better things, actually. They've gone on to um, a double-blind neuroscience study. They've gone on to uh, inspire many books on, on ADD and, and other things that some of my students have, have gone on further with. Um, but it's just the overall message I want to get is that your brain can be hacked and there, there is a real solution for these things. And I want to give you a bunch of tips, you know, in this interview, but that's the biggest thing is, is just believing that you're not stuck the way you were or when everybody tells you that you're, you're a certain way. You're not stuck there. You can change it. You know? oh, this is good. And the more you're talking, the more connections I'm making. So when I was first looking at your work, I was connecting you to an episode I did with Lois Letchford and her son had quite a story that's similar to yours, but it was in first grade. He was told, you know, you've got dyslexia, give up. There's nothing left in this world for you, except, you know, you're going to have to go down this path. And, you know, it was a grim future for him. And he went on to graduate with his PhD from Oxford. So yeah. I thought about that story. And then I also thought about Barbara Aerosmith Young just now. She's from Toronto and she started the Arrowwood schools because she had these 
things in her brain that were missing and did some research, went to the library and created all these programs to help her retrain her brain at a time that she knew, like you, that it wasn't accepted and she had a lot of backlash. Like, I can't even imagine when I was starting to do this work in neuroscience, if people were saying, oh, this is snake oil, because, you know, it's hard. It's hard to get started in a new area, let alone have backlash. And, and it was it was amazing how destructive that period of time of neuroscience was. People forget that the, um, you know, the three strikes rule, remember that the Clinton administration initiated, this is kind of getting into politics, but that had its basis in neuroscience. There was this belief that if you had committed a violent crime, you were essentially on, uh, you, you couldn't be rehabilitated. Not to mention, you know, don't, don't take into account you know, socioeconomic factors or other things. So like they they made this rule that after three strikes, you they'd lock you up and throw away the key because the belief was the brain couldn't change. That came from the neuroscience. And it, it, it's been incredibly destructive and has been the major reason why there's a, there's a large, uh, essentially mostly uh, a minority population in prisons today. So the science really does matter and it really does matter to challenge the science that is wrong, even it's a, if it's accepted. Oftentimes it takes, you know, 10, 20 years later, but this was, this was established that everybody, you know, people took uh, nerve cells basically and put them in a Petri dish, looked at them under a microscope and saw they never divide like every other cell in the body. So your brain must be hardwired. They didn't understand stem cells. They didn't understand that, that your brain can actually regrow parts of it using little pockets of stem cells. And it can do a bunch of other cool things like, uh, like, you know, the, the connections between uh, cells can be changed and things like that. It just, there was just something that we didn't know but in the arrogance, we thought we knew everything. And a lot of people, I mean, I, 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 I kind of suffered from it, but it was minor compared to the way some people have suffered from that policy. And even to this day, you see people who um, just take, they take a diagnosis as a death nail. And I, I think you should take it as a challenge. Um, for anybody who is uh, struggling with dyslexia, um, I don't specifically teach things to, to fight dyslexia. I talk about what's worked for me. Um, I focus on memory and I've got a lot of great tools for ADHD. I've got a focus method that's, that's unparalleled to get people into the flow state. But if you're looking for a good book on dyslexia, the thing that really made a big difference for me is, is called The Gift of Dyslexia. And uh, there was a few exercises in there that made me think of, uh, think of it completely differently. As as, as actually a potential uh, gift of creativity rather than a curse. And I think that's the way we have to approach life is, is you, you do have a disadvantage. Even, um, you know, even the, the chronic pain that I dealt with, uh, my pain tolerance is higher than anybody I know, right? So there is, there is, a, there is a silver lining. I know it sounds kind of hokey, but the simple fact is I am very healthy and I work out and I take care of myself because I know what it feels like to, to be in pain. You know what I mean? And there's a lot of people who didn't have that experience early on in life and they let themselves go. So there's, 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 a, there's a give and take. I think I firmly believe that with every negative, even if it only looks like a negative, there is a positive. There is either a lesson you can learn or some way you can hack it. And then in the process of hacking it, you could make a best-selling program that sells millions around the world. You know, you could do that. <laughs> love it. Love it. I'm going to put all the links to your website in the show notes so people can just click on it and have a look at what programs you offer. But was there a point in your academics, like uh, for, for Lois Letchford's son, um, he noticed that studying maps is where his world opened up. Was there something that you noticed, ah, this is how it works for me in your I early like years? It. Actually, I can tell you a little trick to remember the website. That could be a fun little thing to yeah. start off with. So my, my name is Pharaoh. I got it right here. Yeah. Pharaoh, right? Yeah. Good to do the first thing here. Um, but I made this little logo. It's an F with an arrow coming out, and that's how you, you spell it. So now it's easier to remember. And it's just Pharaoh and then memory. Uh, Pharaoh Communications is my is my PR and marketing firm that I, I also was able to to start. I've had a wonderful career there as well. Um, but that's like that's just an example. Once you take something and you make it more visual, you turn it into something that your brain can handle better. Um, getting on to uh, you know your question, I think that uh, I, I think that that the important thing um, with uh, with having any any sort of um, any sort of turnaround in life, I think the important thing is to find out 
what works for other people and then pick and choose what may work for you. So I suggest you try everything and you might find that my approach is not the perfect approach for everybody, but I will say the techniques that I develop do work for everybody. So I'll, I'll give you a simple example. Um, a lot of people actually just from, from the example you said, a lot of people think in terms of, of uh, being a visual learner or being a different type of learner. And I think I've kind of debunked this a little bit. This is something I, I, I published in my first uh, course and I've, I've got coming up in a book, but um, I, I believe that people uh, don't understand or they're, they're teaching learning styles the wrong way. Uh, there has been a number of studies that have uh, so-called debunked the idea of learning styles, the idea that there's a visual, an auditory, and a kinesthetic way to learn. However, we do know in uh, there, there's other studies that that somehow th they don't show uh, its efficacy, but there have been studies that show that it helps people in self-understanding. That is, there's an aha moment that people get. So there's some phenomenon going on. What I believe is actually going on is that we process information uh, and we have essentially strategies that we like to employ. And they're not a, necessarily a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic, but they look like that. That is, the visual uh, strategy is the big picture thinkers. They want to see the big picture. This is like the map you were talking about, about the, the person from your, from your previous interview. They want to see the big picture first. To get, a, to get a big picture view, then they go down to the smaller details. I myself am very, very comfortable learning that way. And I have a lot of difficulty with the second style, which is sequential learning. And that I would call auditory. The first one visual, you gotta see the big picture. Auditory sound only goes in a straight line. So I think when people are really good at learning from lectures or really good at, at following step-by-step -step instructions, they think they're an auditory learner, but those same people would be just as good if they saw it written on a page. So it's not the whether you use your eyes or ears, it's how your brain processes the information, in my opinion. This is kind of my uh, my take on it. And the third category would be the kinesthetic learner, the so-called touchy-feely learners. People have to learn by touching. Uh, they don't necessarily have to learn by touching. Uh, in my experience, I've taken people who are self-styled kinesthetic learners, and really what it is is they learn by trial and error. They have to do so you can teach a kinesthetic learner math, but they have to try doing the exercise a few times, make a few mistakes, then get an insight, you know? And people think in academia that, you know, trial and error is like the worst strategy to learn something. But if you go in the business world, you look at Silicon Valley, most inventions have come from trial and error. You know, there's there's a phrase called fail fast and fail hard, you know, in, in the unicorn world of, of, of startup technology. You try things and half of it works, half of it doesn't. You go with the part that, that, that does work and keep on going. So it can be an incredibly powerful strategy just in the right setting. And the problem is, and I'm sorry I'm going long here, but my thesis here for this answer is that there's some people who look at one setting like a classroom and they think that that applies to all settings and it just doesn't. So they looked at my one setting, I was performing really poorly there, but you take that same person, you know, like ADD people, for example, um, on average make more money according to several studies than people who don't have ADHD. That's a disability a lot of people would like to have. But the reason is when you look into the numbers, ADD people usually choose to run their own business because they can't, they can't go by a clock. They wanna be in charge of their own time and schedule I'm the boss in my businesses, so I can relate to that. And of course, people who run their own businesses, it's a tough life at certain points, but generally speaking, they're, they're gonna have a higher uh, income cap potential. And that's really, that, that, that's really what I wanted to get across is you know, the, the different styles of learner it, in the classroom, those people who are really good at listening to a lecture and regurgitating information, that is a style of learning that is very effective for some people and other people really flounder, but that doesn't mean that they're below. And we get ranked in this hierarchy in the classroom and it doesn't really reflect the real world. I think a lot of people see that. So uh, what I did is I came up with strategies, much like the, the map strategy we're talking about, different strategies to take things like that lecture and turn it into something that my brain really enjoyed. I, I would do things like, you know, take notes with mind maps. I would use linking. I would use what I call matrixing, which is how to organize information. And then I could take a lecture and I could turn it into a big picture. It was on my notepad, but it was a big picture that I could then understand the whole thing and then go down to the fine details. So my real goal is to empower anybody to learn, uh, empower students and of all ages to, to not try to change 
kind of the world or, you know, get rid of lectures or get rid of classrooms or anything like that, but try to get the individual to be able to handle any situation. You're going to be on the job and you're going to have to learn a new software program. And by the way, you don't have a, a tutor or a teacher and there's no video on YouTube. Like you've got to figure it out in the real world. And I want to give st skills and tools that anybody can just become a super learner, like, you know, have that have that advantage of, of learning about eight times faster than the average person, which is which is the average that my, my students get from my program. Oh, this is good. This is so good. So can we actually go right to what got you into the Guinness World Book of Records for memory? Because like we're we're right there. And I watched you on the Fox TV Superhuman show and you were being tested by memorizing 109 balloon colors. And it, they were like red and blue, but you had to know which row was red and which one was blue. And then I was thinking, what strategy is he using as he's closing his eyes? What is he doing? What's he thinking? How on the earth could you memorize 59 decks of shuffled cards when I can struggle to remember 10 things on a list? What are you doing? I, I will and I, I will happily tell you how it works. You do have to practice in order to do what I'm going to tell you, though, because it does. It is a skill set. Think of it like I'm an Olympic athlete. Uh, you know, to, to get to that level, I had to practice quite a bit. Uh, but, uh, you know, going to the, the balloons, that is a visual representation of binary code. And there's a number of uh, strategies to memorize binary code. And essentially what I do is I created a code to memorize the code. And what I mean is that um, binary code is simply, you know, ones and zeros, right? right. If I just memorized uh, that information, it would get very repetitive. That is, if I made a visual image involving just two items, one that represented one and one that was represented zeros, I'd have a lot of repetition. It would actually get quite confusing. Hmm. So what I actually did is I, I uh, created a, a four digit code. So every four, um, uh, four digits, uh, would actually turn into a sound. And then I could actually make words out of those sounds. And that, that was kind of the strategy I used. That, by the way, there's a number of different codes for binary. And even if I were to do the uh, do the feed again today, I might choose something else depending on what I'd practiced. But that, I, I was really good at that, you know, particular code at the time. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to dive into this because it's better to, you know, go go with the, the, the strategy you have. So, Essentially, what I what I was doing was, and I, I had to memorize those 109 balloons. It was less than uh, 30 seconds that I, I went through. It was actually sorry, less than 60 seconds uh, that I that I, I went through it. I wish they had a timer on me because I was a lot faster. They actually made it look like it took a longer time because they wanted to draw out the drama on the screen. Yeah. I was like, no, that was like. <laughs> I was, that was, I was training for speed and you didn't even time it. But um, <laughs> anyway, so, so the long story short is if I saw four digits, you know, then that would, that would turn into a, a letter and then, you know, make several letters. I would add vowels to, uh, to turn them into words. And then I can link these words together. So by, you know, that whole, you know, 109 balloons that turns into, you know, a few objects. And then I just link the objects together. The challenge was, in being able to recall because they made me go from left to right and then up and down and backwards. So I had to really make kind of a matrix in my head so I'd have the ability to go up and down and backwards and, and right and left uh, with uh, with that strategy. So that, that was a real mental challenge of just visualizing and getting it right. And, and it was a lot of fun too. That was, was wild. And then somebody <laughs> said, no, this row, no, this one. And I'm thinking yeah, yeah, yeah. in your head, are you going back to like cross out the first one? And Yeah, and, and the other thing is I had to do it quickly because because there's an audience and you know if, if I take too long and they get bored then it's not entertaining and they're not going to vote for me so I knew I had to just I was pushing myself to do this like super fast to just really be impressive because it was just an opinion thing uh you know so I won I won the episode I beat I beat all the other uh players there uh, I think because I was able to kind of have that that sharp wit and really quick response you know Oh, that was really cool to watch. But so, I'll so tell you the strategy for the for the Guinness record. I'm sure yeah. a lot of people that. So um, there have been a number of people who have tried to break this uh, Guinness record and they haven't been able to. Uh, but I will say this: there are people who have memorized more decks of cards. Uh, but this particular record has a very uh, low failure, uh, very low error rate. You're only allowed 0.5 percent wrong. Something like uh, you know 20 something cards out of 3,068 cards. Like it's very very few. I got only one mistake in my last record, and I think that really intimidated people because I've been holding it for you know going on like 10 years now. Um, 
So the strategy I had was a number of things. So there's a number of challenges. First, I can teach you how to memorize one deck of cards, and that is pretty impressive. It's a lot of fun. Um, I have a code that turns the cards into images. So actually, I can I, you can visualize this right now. If you imagine an eight of hearts, if you, if you kind of picture it in your mind, there's like an eight here. There's the two circles and then the heart underneath. I use an ice cream cone to visualize the eight of hearts. See how the uh, the two the two circles and the the heart kind of look like an ice cream cone with two yeah. scoops on it. So I've uh, that's called a visual peg list, and I was able to turn that into um, a uh, a four card uh, system. That is, I could take four cards and turn them into one combined image, one thing for every four cards. That really cut down on my work. Then. I had to connect those cards to something because I literally had times where I had, you know, five or six aces, uh, sorry, queen of spades in a row, I had four queen of spades in a row, for example. So I had to make sure that I, I kept track of them, kept them in order. So I take these, uh, this four card link, turn it into an image, and then I would place it in a journey, uh, a, a mental journey, like a, a place around my room. But I had a very long journey and it actually included um, scenes from movies, actually. Uh, the, the journey was so long, I had to place these mental cards, you know, on, you know, a uh, uh, Boba Fett's head in one case and things like that. Yeah. And then what I would do is I would start at the beginning of the movie in my head and the first scene, I would visualize that. And then the silly images that I put in there would remind me of the cards. Then I'd go to the next one, and the next one, the next one. But the key was to get to 3,068 cards with only one mistake. The key was focus. Other memory people have been able to memorize similar amounts uh, of information, uh, sometimes you know quite fast, but there's a lot more errors. And that's because the brain doesn't like to focus for very long. It actually starts to shut down. And this uh, is the technique that I invented. It's called focus bursts. And essentially, I mean, I, I wanna give like a, a, a brief synopsis of it. Uh, but uh, if you go, if, if anybody really suffers from any sort of uh, focus issues, or if you find that you're just procrastinating, studying that sort of thing, or it takes you forever to memorize some things, then this is pretty much the solution. Uh, essentially, your brain, because of brain chemistry, it tends to go into kind of a hibernation or, um, you know, kind of the 10% mode, as I call it, uh, after about 15 to 20 minutes of any sort of mental activity, whether it's studying, uh, you know, reading complex tasks, things like that could because your brain can't keep high level mental functioning for very long your hormones kind of go out of balance we're talking uh, more epinephrine and 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 uh, uh, um, serotonin and adrenaline things like that um, so without getting too complex you know some of your brain chemistry is burnt up and it produces a byproduct usually serotonin that makes you feel sleepy if you try to push yourself too hard and a lot of people mitigate that with lovely caffeine which is a great thing, but it's only temporary, <laughs> you know? Uh, there you go. So, but, but I'll tell you, even taking caffeine, you'll feel more alert, but you won't test as well. This is one of the really fascinating things that the brain is really good at tricking you into thinking you're learning something. Have you ever studied something for a long time and then you think you know it and then you get tested and you don't know crap? Mm -hmm. it's, it's because of this sort of phenomenon. So what I did instead was I turned studying into interval training. Uh, I had a timer and I would time I would study really intensely. Like I had a, had a set goal for a short period of time, usually about four to eight minutes. Uh, and that is the prime time that I knew my brain would be fresh and alert. Studies show you're at like 90% recall rate if you study uh, in that fresh zone. Then I give myself a short break, about five minutes to get my brain chemistry to rebalance. And I would do something fun, like even play a video game I had on pause or something like that. And then I'd go back to, to the focus burst. And it was this burst and break and burst and break. And the neat thing was, because I never exhausted myself, I never got to the point where there was so much serotonin built up that I was exhausted or tired or turned into melatonin and, and made you feel sleepy. I never got to that point. I could actually study for hours and hours and hours, and I wasn't tired. I wasn't even fatigued. If anything, I had difficulty falling asleep because I was so you know jazzed. It was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And I found I could go through work incredibly fast. I'm talking four or five times faster than typical. And I run, I run several businesses now. I get all my work done this way. Uh, and that was the secret behind the Guinness record. I broke up these decks of cards into basically a half a deck at a time. Um, even though they were all shuffled together, I'll make it clear they were all shuffled together, but they were broken up into packs of 52, even though it's not a true deck. People in the memory world care about that point. So I'm making that point. Um, so I do about a half a deck at a time. And then I would just clear my head for a couple of minutes, then do another half and clear my head. And by 
training your brain to do go off and on, off and on, you never uh, go at that zombie level, you know, where you're just kind of looking at the page and you forgot to have the last paragraph or two that you just read. You never get into that state where your brain starts to shut off and go mush. You're always at that peak performance. And then just as, as you start to, you know, decline, you take that short break. And I kind of liken it to, you know, if someone's chopping down a tree, if they took a break every few minutes to sharpen their ax, they would never get tired. And that's really what it feels like to study this way. And that, that's the best I can describe it. There are exercises, there's a whole test you have to do for your focus system and, 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 and what's the best strategy for you. And there's memory modes, there's a whole bunch in the course, but that's the best I can describe right here to show how, how it works. Well, that makes complete sense for the work that I'm doing. We talk a lot about brain network theory and the fact that Einstein talks about how these creative insights came in and the fact that, you know, imagination is lacking in our schools because we don't give our kids these little break times. So it makes complete sense to me how the brain works and how your strategy works. So this is this is good. Now, the full the full program is at uh, ferromemory.com and we have a number of options for people to go through. And, and I got to tell you, if if uh, the feedback I've gotten has been incredible, I had I had one student. Oh, man. Um, uh, her name was Barbara. She was I believe she was around 13 or 14 years old. She was diagnosed with ADHD, but she was taking a type of medication that caused her to lose her appetite. She literally couldn't eat. But she she was taking this medication for ADD uh, during the week. And then on the weekends, she would literally have to force feed herself. Her mom was helping her to try to gain weight back because she was literally starving herself during the week. And it was a hellish way to live. And when she started using some of these strategies, she was actually crying because she didn't no, nobody went up to her and said, hey, think about information differently. Don't just it's not just willpower. You're not you're not evil or wrong because you can't focus for more than two minutes. You have to strategize your time better. And I wish I wish if, if there's one message I could get out to people like that, that would be it is that there's that there's nothing wrong with you. You're not broken. You just have to run your machine in the right way and you can be superhuman. Mm -hmm. It's that self-awareness. You were able to be aware that it wasn't working for you and you created yeah. the solution, which I think is purely brilliant. And the so, best part, is, uh, I, I hope my goal at least is that I've, I've, you know, I use that ladder to get where I'm in life and, and I'm, I'm very comfortable and everything and doing well. And I want to throw that ladder behind me to help others. And that's, that's the goal in life, I think. That is, that is what we're all supposed to do. And so, so here I am this weekend looking at your website and I couldn't help but notice seeing Harry Lorraine. And I don't remember where he was, but he was some sort of reference that you had somewhere. And when I worked with Bob Proctor in the seminar industry, he talked about Harry Lorraine all the time. He was the one, he was like Harry Lorraine and his memory. And, um, and maybe he hadn't, have you ever met Bob Proctor being in Toronto or do you I, know? I I've actually, I've shared the stage with Bob Proctor. Wonderful. As well, yeah, he's, he's a great guy. And uh, I also have, uh, was on the same stage as Zig Ziglar and uh, and uh, uh, Brian Tracy and all, all the greats. There's a great Good. guy. And I think everybody out there should read every single thing those people have written. It's it's fantastic. Um, Harry Lorraine is, uh, is a genius. Uh, he essentially, he was the bridge. So memory techniques were part of the first academy going back to uh, to ancient Greece. You know, the, like Aristotle and the first the first few uh, uh, courses, if you will, in any sort of organized educational system, one of them was the art of memory, you know, like right up there with math and everything else. But over time, academia kind of stopped teaching memory because it was a more of an apprentice style art, like one person like myself would show other people, hey, here's how it goes. And you got to do a little trial and error. It was a little customizable and it wasn't as easy to teach as, say, math, which is objectively true. It's not so subjective, you know. Mm -hmm. But what happened with the art of memory was uh, mentalists took it up. And, uh, you know, for the most part of the 20th century, these uh, these magicians on stage would do all sorts of these memory tricks, pass them off as magic tricks. The irony is that if you actually knew how the trick was done, it's even more impressive. Like like they would do a trick where they would like psychically, you know, they would say it's psychic where they would know the date that everybody uh, was born. If you give me your birthday, I give you like what day of the week it was. And you can look at a book to tell it's true and everything. The truth is they memorized uh, the first Sunday of every month 
going back like a hundred years. And that 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 is even more impressive than the psychic feat, but they, they pass it off as psychic and right. mentalism. And 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 Harry Lorraine was one of the people who started off as a mentalist and then said, okay, I'm gonna retire as a magician and I'm gonna start teaching this stuff. And he taught it really well. Yeah, he had an incredibly popular uh infomercial. Uh and uh yeah, and it was it was uh it was fantastic. I got a chance to talk to him um a number of years ago and he uh he, he's 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 really a really a cool guy. He's um he's very intense, uh, and he wishes more people remembered him and everything. So I always take a take a moment out to remind everybody kind of where in North America the memory uh memory history came from. His uh -oh. course was one of the first I looked at. Although I don't I don't think it's 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 everything. It's very comprehensive, and it was a it was a great start. Oh, it was fun to see some people who might have influenced you. And I wondered, was there anyone else as you were starting in this? Were you looking at who else was doing this or how did you stay motivated to keep paving a path? Um, yeah, well, you know, the, the weird thing was it was it was the desire to help people that started me in the beginning. Um, but then that started to shoot me in the foot. Um, I, I, I don't know if this is a great talking point for media, but just to tell the honest truth, I was very much a martyr at first. I was doing seminars for, for very little money because I wanted to get my name known. I wanted to help a lot of people. But I actually found that later on uh, by, by charging a reasonable amount for the work, you know, uh, I actually was able to do much more. And by, by telling people, hey, this is something of value. Uh, this is kind of a lesson any creator out there. If you think that there's an extra value in offering it for free, people kind of dismiss it. So that's why I'm, I'm doing very well, but we still charge for our course, right? Yeah. Uh, and the the reason is that people value it as a result. And if you invest that money in yourself, you actually get a huge return on that investment. So that was really a, a big turning point when I started to realize that I could help a lot of people, but the passion really was that I also had to run it as a successful business in order to help people. I had to do both. And I, I made kind of that shift. But then um, the interesting thing is when I, when I was running it as a business and, and trying to make money at it, the amount of positive feedback I got, the amount of emails and even, even snail mail letters that I got of people who, you know, they, they, they went to law school and medical school because they learned these techniques and they were, they were failing and this completely turned around their life. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how I feel about the lawyers some days, but I guess the, the doctors kind of balance out the lawyers that I've created in this world, I guess. You know, I, I, I only joke and I, I, of course, someday I'll need a lawyer and that'll be good. That'll be good to have, you know, a few, a few that like me. Um, but, uh, but that's it. it. It was really that sort of uh, feedback that really inspired me to keep going. Uh, and to keep innovating because the the entire book is not written yet. The the, the mind and space um, and I would say the quantum world are the three areas that we know the least about. And and we are just I mean, one neuroscientist, I think uh, I, you might remember his name. I don't recall it at this time, but one neuroscientist said that, uh, you know, when he was receiving an award, he said that we're you know, what we know about the mind or about the brain, we are nothing but, um, you know, a, a, a drunken fool sitting underneath um, a, 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 um, a street light, you know, fumbling for our keys in our pocket. And the brain is the city. Like we are, we, we know so little and every day we learn more and more and more. I mean, just the, the recent advances, like they're even looking at, at a potential vaccine for Alzheimer's. I mean, you know, that would have been unheard of even 10 years ago. And I, I can't imagine what's gonna happen in the next 10 years, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating area, which is why I can't uh, stop doing these podcasts and researching and reading books. It's like, I'm doesn't matter where I am, I've got a book open somewhere. And so I was also looking at uh, your website and noticing some people that I've come across over the years in sales and motivation, who I've learned from these same lessons you're talking about, the way that you've got to make money off of your ideas. Um, Greg Reed, who was the creator of Secret Knock, and he's written so many books out there. And then you've got the late Frank Shankwitz. We lost him this year, um, who was the founder of Make-A-Wish. Um, so how, how are you now using your talents to give back these ideas? So is it all through feral communications? Is it speaking? How, how exactly could people go to your website and what can they get from you? Yeah, um, I, I think uh, the, the world cried a tear when Frank left. I mean, I, I think we all think of ourselves as good people. And then when I met that guy, I feel like I'm 
I'm just a jerk compared to him. He is he is such a such a beautiful soul. Um, and that, that was a real tragedy. But, you know, the legacy that he's left, the legacy that he's left behind is fantastic. He was actually a, a great mentor to me. I asked him advice about just how to live and how to how to make decisions. And he was always there. He would tell help out anybody that was was trying to do good in the world, no matter, you know, whether it could financially help him or anything. He he worked at Make-A-Wish for years, never took a salary, you know, and still stayed as a sheriff. Like just that that guy's life, they made a movie about him. And I, I think they should they should teach a class to every high school student. Everybody should know that guy's uh, life. Um, sorry, I got a little distracted because I was thinking of Frank. But uh, but yeah, also you know, Greg Reed. Uh, these are these are some of the people that I've I've uh, you know sp spoken with on stages. Unfortunately, you can't reach everybody on stage. So you know we do have the internet where I can uh, you know get this out to uh, to the rest of the world. Um, I think. I think the the all all those wonderful people that you've mentioned uh, really inspired me to aim higher. You know, I um I was doing memory for a long time, had an international bestseller, sold you know something like ten million dollars worth of courses, very successful, very proud. And then you know other authors came up to me and say, well, how did did you do that? How did you get on like the, the Today Show and, and you know, Regis and Kelly, Regis and, Kelly and, and uh, Steve Harvey and stuff like that. So I started up a, a marketing company and, and we do PR and marketing for people. We actually did uh, Greg Reed's book and I'm on like Business Insider and stuff. So that was my career for a little while. But I, I have realized that um, the, the art of memory, I'm not done uh, teaching it. There's a lot more. I feel like the world has finally caught up to where I am and uh, now uh, we want to we want to really get this uh, out to everyone. So yeah, I kind of wear a couple of hats, but I, I think that's a typical ADD thing. I like to do a few things to keep me interested and keep me excited, uh, you know, with it. But um, so uh, yeah, I do want to I do want to speak and I do travel. I have traveled the whole time around the world uh, speaking to audiences and sometimes thousands, but you, you can't really reach that many people uh, that way. I do speak on the college circuit. I, I love going to orientations or, uh, or, or reading week and teaching them how to study. There's usually this aha moment for students. Um, but uh, it, it's not enough. I want to reach everybody, you know, because everybody should have a manual for how their brain works and at least have what we know so far, you know. Uh, it makes life so much easier to use, you know. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and you've got the Farrell method that was proven at McGill's University Neuroscience Study. Um, what exactly is the Farrell method? So if... Sure. Like for high-powered executives or students, what is it? Yeah, so th there's three main groups of people that, that that come to us. One is students, so we have a very comprehensive student study program. Uh, and then, like you said, there is that those ambitious types that want to just become superhumans, but they don't want to be the next memory guy. They are be on stage. They want to memorize everybody's name in their company. For example, actually, I have. One, one client of mine actually uh, named John, who um, in the last recession, he uh, he was in his 40s and he used memory techniques to memorize everybody he could at his insurance company, the company in, in Canada. He memorized everybody in like in that in that building. And uh, basically they uh, had downsized at one point. Now he was just doing memory techniques to help uh, hold off Alzheimer's and you know train your brain and just have a healthy brain, that sort of thing. He felt like he was getting forgetful and it really sharpened him up. But then when they were uh, downsizing, they fired about a third of the staff at one, at one point. This was like in 08. And uh, he was kept. In fact, he was put in charge of another department. Now, he had a lot more work. But he told me that months later, they were going through like an audit and he was rifling through papers. And he found the memo from higher ups that decided who was going to stay and who was going to go. And he saw his name on it. And it was circled. And it said leadership potential. Right. And the insinuation was the fact that he had memorized everybody that that was leadership potential, you know? And it was, it was just, it was this amazing aha moment where, you know, when you, when you choose to improve yourself and put yourself forward and succeed in life, then other people do notice, even when you think they're not noticing, they do notice, you know? And, and it, it, it's, um, yeah, it's the little things like that inspire me too. You know, even my, my students inspire me every day to keep going. Yeah, definitely. And, and you never realize as you're learning something new, how you're impacting. So like what you've taught other people, how that person was now impacting. When you when you get there's a lot of people who say stories, but when you get like real feedback like that, you know that you're onto something special. And that's really what makes me passionate, you know, and I'm, 
I'm a father now too. So I'm worried about my son. And you know, one time he, he went up to me recently, he was really struggling with reading, but during COVID he's had spotty education at best. He's a, mm -hmm. I think he's a little ADD. He's a little having difficulty with the virtual stuff, things like that. Yeah. Um, and he's really stressed out. I wanted to sit down and do some reading stuff. And he was like, no, I don't want to do it because it scares me. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I sat down with him and I said, you know what, as you grow, I'm going to teach you all the brain hacks I know and all the little special tricks and secrets that even your teachers don't know to make you superhuman and his face just lit up because people know that there is there's there's tools and secrets out there they just don't know where to get them you know and uh and when i saw that i realized that I, until the day i die my job is not done i i gotta tell everybody about this this is good this is good well is there anything important that you think i've missed just to kind of wrap this up and send people off to your website, learn more about what they can do to really tie in on our memory and thinking. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess just the, uh, the mnemonic, the, the Pharaoh, Pharaoh F with an arrow. I used to do an Egyptian Pharaoh way back in the day. It was, it was kind of cheesy and everything, but, uh, today I'm much more elegant. So I got this nice little logo here with the arrow coming out and everything. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that works well, but, um, I, want to, I want to tell people actually, you know, if you want to know a little, we can end off with a little memory trick here. Here's a couple sure. of things you can do next time you're forgetful, try looking up. Uh, there's a bundle of nerves behind your eyeball. You, you know, this, but I'm telling the audience, there's a bundle of nerves behind your eyeball called the optic nerve. And in study after study, they've shown that the direction you point your eyes actually helps direct energy in the brain. Now, we don't know exactly why, but looking up somehow makes it easier to recall visual information. And that generally helps you when you're trying to, you know, remember where you put lost items and things like that. So pausing, taking a deep breath and looking up is a lot better than panicking. And even just having a strategy like that, having something to do rather than just panicking because you're blanking out and someone puts you on the spot, that is so important because cortisol, the stress hormone, uh, interferes with our ability to recall information as well. So panicking will do you no good. So um, and I like it's kind of positive thinking, you know, just keep looking up, right? Yeah, it's funny. I look up all the time when someone asks me something that I don't know right now and I have to think. I look up if you were to and, ask. And it's, yeah, it's, it's natural. But you know what? You know who doesn't look up? Ooh. Kids at exams, right? Oh. Because we have to stare. Keep your eyes oh. on your paper, Mr. Farrow, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so so we've, we've taught kids keep looking down and then we wonder why they blank out. What happens when you hand in? You're like staring at this question. Oh, I know the answer. I know the answer. You hand it in. You give up. You walk out the door. I'm talking about students now. The yeah. Students walk out the door and you start walking down the hallway. And then like five seconds later, you remember the answer to the question. What were you doing in those last five seconds? You were looking up and thinking about it, right? Uh, so when you understand how your brain works, it empowers you to do so much more. And one strategy doesn't just improve your life like, you know, 10% or something, because that one looking up thing, that applies to today, tomorrow, next week, next month. It has this cumulative effect. And then you add on the, the mnemonic techniques, then you add on the focus techniques, you add on all these different strategies. You have a tool in your chest for every single situation, whether it's, memorizing the exact order of 109 balloons in 30 seconds um or it's uh you know learning how to speak thai before i have to you know go on a flight to to thailand to speak to dipaya insurance you know for right. example so um having this ability to to absorb information quickly to be that savant uh it's within everybody's grasp i'm not special i think i'm really good at teaching it uh, and i think about information differently so i come up with these techniques but anybody absolutely anybody can use these techniques maybe even surpass the things that i've done i would i would be so happy for it i'd love to see it this is good i want to thank you so much for your time today dave for all you're doing to help lift up especially those who think they don't have a chance for the mind blowing results that you've attained. So thank you so much for being here today. For those who wanna learn more about your programs, I'll put all the links into the show notes to your website and your programs throughout at all points. You can just click on it. You're also yep. on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. And I want to tell everybody to support your podcast. If they got some value out of this, they should thank you. And if they are going to go to my site, don't, don't, uh, don't, don't do a workaround and everything. Just use the affiliate link. She deserves it. You know, this is, it's, it's a great thing that, that you're doing. You're, you're bringing a, a light to a whole bunch of uh, people who have ideas and strategies and anybody who, who watches the show on a regular basis, I think will be much more successful in life. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.